strategist and designer who has worked with some of the world's biggest yeah. brands and agencies. We are very lucky to have him with Imminem right now, uh, currently working on a project at MLB, so very exciting. Uh, Clarence has a passion for driving transformation through disruptive design thinking and loves to inspire teams and organizations to reach their highest creative Thank you very much. Thank you for that great intro. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> also swag, so that's the other thing. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm going to stay out of the light of this thing. But um, how many in the room have heard of design thinking? So, and, okay, that's a good amount. We've heard about it, we've heard about it, we've heard about it, we've heard about it, we've talked about it. Um, and, you know, for me, you know, we all have our own interpretation of it, so if you know it, you know that it's basically a process by which we seek to understand what we didn't before. Um, we want to challenge what exists, um, and that's kind of my jam. Like, I love to challenge the status quo and be disruptive and try to figure out how to do something different that's never been done before. Um, and we want to also redefine solutions. So we want to go into our clients and we want to, you know, help them basically refine their products and rethink the way that they've been doing it, just to keep up with the times and, you know, just to remain competitive in general, right? So for me, that's what it is. And this is all in an attempt to make something that somebody's gonna love. But that's really, at the end of the day, what we're trying to do. Like, if you're a developer, if you're a designer, that's what you want to do. You want to make something that people love. And that's what I'm all about. So what I'm gonna do is basically, okay. ah, there we go. Design thinking for me, I use the double diamond method. How many of you have heard of the double diamond design thinking? A little bit fewer people, um, but basically, it's 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 a philosophy where you know you're either designing the right thing or you're designing the thing right. But first, let's talk about designing the right thing. In this stage of designing the right thing, we want to learn. Like this is where we want to build up enough empathy so we can create a product that humans will actually like to use. Um, so we do that by learning what it is that they need. Right? We do. We have a basically. A, a research and synthesis phase. So in our research phase, obviously, we go out, we do different things, we can do one-on-one -on -one interviews, we can do focus groups, we can do outspatial field studies. There's a list of UX practices that you can do for research, but essentially it boils down into two groups, which is primary and, re and, and, and secondary research. Um, and basically, it all starts with you know, point A, right? We don't know what it could be. Right? At this point, we're kind of in the dark, right? We, we kind of think about something, we have a problem, we want, to have, we want to get to a solution, but we don't know where to start. So in this case, you know, we open a case file, which includes sort of like the question, the problem, or idea, the problem space that you want to solve. We, we, basically, we basically take that, and we bring it into the research phase, and we apply our primary and secondary research. From the secondary and primary research, we then form a synthesis, which basically, we basically communicate our findings through themes and clusters, key insights, and then we finally come up with opportunities that, that, that could help with the solution. And then finally, we get into what I like to call a challenge statement, which, you know, it's good to have opportunities, but if you go into your opportunities without an actual challenge as defined, you might be solving the wrong challenge. So, you know, challenges are a good way to go. And if you know the double diamond, you can see I've created an iterative process around the strategy, whereas the traditional diamond it doesn't do that. I think you should iterate on strategy just to make sure you have the right challenge. So that was kind of like my own little twist there. Um, and then we get to designing the thing right. And this is where you get into the good stuff, right? This is where you do design, this is where you validate, and you push the solution out. In design phase, you have your ideas. Um, and in, in, that, in that phase, you are imagining what it would be. Blue sky, sky's the limit. Um, you also prioritize the ideas. And then you develop a hypothesis and you assess your riskiest assumptions. So basically, you know, when you want to, you want to do that because you don't, you're assuming with these ideas what the user wants still at this stage. As you can see, you're still diverging. Um, so you want to get down to a point where you can validate something so that you can actually start to converge and get to an actual solution. And then from there, you can prototype your actual solution, put it out in the field, learn from it, build, and measure. We all know the drill, right? But this, to me, is like the process to get to don't know should be. And at the bottom of the diamond, you see there's some outputs here. So like, in the beginning, you got a question of the problem or idea. 
and you get unstructured research findings, then you have a guided strategic approach that helps you along the way, then you have your initial set of plausible solutions, and then you do an MVP and then you create a rollout plan of how you iterate on top of that. Um, and so I added another piece of this, which is your line of sight. As you can see, at point A, it's kind of small, but at point B, it's a wide, it's a wide view. You can pretty much see the big picture at that point. You know where you want to go, right? So enough talking about design thinking. We're going to do some design doing. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to come up with a hypothetical problem. Let me ask you, show of hands, how many people have gone to lunch at work? Okay. Let me write this down. I have to capture like how many people said that. How many people bring their lunch to work? out of the people that actually, okay. And how many people go out to lunch? Oh, a little bit less, that's surprising. Okay, so bringing lunch, I would say is about 60, whereas going out is about 40. All right, cool. Let me uh, write a journey on this on this board here, actually, the whiteboard I'm gonna use. By the way, time is a little messy, as you can tell. So like, it's not gonna be as organized or as smooth as you might think it will go. You have to be prepared for the unknown, and that's cool too, because you know, when you're a designer, that's all you do is go into the unknown to find what you don't know. Um, so I'm gonna do a journey right now about lunch. So I would think, and this is, you know, anybody can correct me if I'm wrong, you basically, we're gonna solve for the people who actually bring their lunch. So you prepare it at home, right? And then you bring it to work. Then you store it somewhere. I would think. I would hope. <laughs> <laughs> then when it's time to eat, you prepare it or you warm it up or something like that. Then you eat, and that's pretty much it. And then you throw it away. I mean, do we think that this is the journey that we do? Cool. But, Oh, clean up after yeah, we eat? Yeah, I clean up the Clean up. Okay, cool. Does clean grocery shop go in there somewhere? <laughs> uh, I would say prepare. Well, prepare. That's like when you're like prepping it. Like everything at home is prepared. Yeah. But just for the sake of this short talk. <laughs> um, yeah. Because we know a lot goes into you people who bring lunch. I mean, you know, the allergies and the diet and the gluten-free. And, you know, I get it. I shop at, I shop at Trader Joe's too. <laughs> um, so this is our journey. Would you would you agree that this is the journey of, of people that bring your food? Yeah. All right, cool. Now, which of this which part of this journey brings you the most to life? Just throw it at me. Eating, cleaning, eating. <laughs> Somebody said preparing, preparing, eating. How many eating? Preparing. Okay. So we're just gonna say gives people the most. Delight. I'm gonna put a smiley face here. That's what people like the most. Okay, where is the most friction in this, do you think? Clean up. Clean up? No. Preparing? Preparing. Uh, no. Preparing. Oh, the, the, oh, bring, so you prepare the bring, you store, and then you, actually he would heat it up, yeah. Well, actually, but there is one more part. What is it? Viking. What is it? Packing. Packing. You need to pack it first. You prepare and then you need to buy it all. You're talking literally step by step. <laughs> I skipped a few steps. <laughs> all right. So we think that, who thinks that preparing your meal when you bring it to work is the, is the most friction? Preparing at work. What about, what about preparing at home? Yeah, right? yeah. Yeah. Preparing at home? Yeah. Cool. So we got this part, which makes people the most oops, sad. <laughs> that's a guy that's sad. He's like cursing. He's saying F words and stuff. All right, so preparing is where we get the most friction. No problem. All right, so I'm going to move on now to, that was my research, by the way. Thank you very much. That was my research. Um, and so I'm going to go into key insight. What I just learned from this is that people like to eat the food, but they hate to prepare the food. And that's big, right? Like that's huge, that's our aha moment. Like, you want to eat it, but you don't want to prepare it. Typical humans. <laughs> um, so, that is, <laughs> so that's gonna be the problem we want to solve, this preparing part. How can we make that even better, right? So that's our opportunity. I feel like our opportunity is right here. 
This is if we could get this right, bringing lunch to work would be so much better. I think, right? So how might we? And this is my challenge statement. I want to challenge now. How might we reduce the friction of preparing lunch so that we feel more productive at work? How's that for a challenge statement? You good? I think that's good. I mean, I had this in my back pocket. I didn't make that up. <laughs> it's it's a challenge statement. So this is going to be our guiding. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Huh? How you can make preparation better? Yeah. So how might we reduce the? How might we make preparations better, so that we feel more productive at work? Okay, we can go with that one. Great challenge statement. I'll tell you the importance of a challenge statement. You have to have it where you have the problem within it, which is the problem, which is prep. You want to have sort of like the end result, the vision within it as well. So making it better, and being more productive. And you also want to have the benefit for the user in your challenge statement all the time. And in this case, feel more productive, right? So that's going to be something that if you do it right, you'll feel more productive. So I'm going to play a game now of ideas. This is the fun part. Now we're into design, right? So we're going to idea. We're going to ideate. I like to play a game called What If. And basically, if you have an idea, just say What If, and then your idea. So I need three ideas. So What If? You just bought it already prepared. No, we're talking like Chipotle or like. <laughs> <laughs> what if you brought it prepared? Meaning, he's talking about leftovers. What was that? What if? What if I hire a chef? Okay. What if I hired a chef? Okay. Well, I just delegated. What if I delegate it to a family member? What if you delegate this to a family member? Yes. The whole process? <laughs> <laughs> They're going to eat it for you too? <laughs> just the mom can do this. <laughs> what if I delegate? All right, cool. Those are three strong ideas. I got, I got one, one more? I mean, that's what it said, but um, there's companies that do meal preps for you. Like I use Muscle Maker Grill. Okay. And meal prep for my week. And yep. For your food day. Cool. So I'm going to do leftover slash meal prep here. So that feels kind of the same, but not quite. So we got three big strong ideas. What if you bought it prepared or through a meal prep? What if you hired a chef? Or what if you delegated it to a family member? Show of hands, who votes for our number one? What if you bought it prepared? You got two there. One, two, three, four. Yes. What if you hired a chef? Votes? Show of hands, two. No. Hired a chef, two. Can we vote twice? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can vote right. twice. You can vote twice. What's that? It's not an object. Money is not an object. Your budget. Holy shit. This is a lot of. Oh, sorry. Was I supposed to? Wow. Everybody wants to hire you. Okay. What if you delegated to your family member? One, two, three. One, two, three. Looks like what if we hired a chef is winning right now. So basically, that's how we design things. We just did it in like 10 minutes. We literally are on the path to building a solution where a chef is included. That's really what's gonna happen right now. And so if we really wanted to hack lunch in a real life environment, we would then take that chef idea, flesh it out into a prototype, build it, test it, learn it, iterate on it, and push it out for the people and make everybody happy in this room who wants to have a chef. That's design thinking, like in a, in a nutshell. That cool? That was fun, right? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so um, I've been taking this UI UX course. Yeah. It talks about uh, personas. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to designing for uh, specific audiences. Yeah. Does that play a role in the design? Designing the right thing or designing the thing right? Personas come up in the research. Uh, okay. So you gotta first understand. This question right here, right? Primary research and secondary research, it gets to find here who you're going to learn from. Like, what do you want to learn, who you want to learn it from, and how you're going to learn it happens right here. 
and that's where the personas kind of get built and everything. What are the typical constraints that clients have during the design thinking process? Time. You need key stakeholders in the room to do this. Like, you need people who can make decisions, like, fast. And those, because right now, we just made a lot of decisions. But if I start to build a solution where a chef is included and Gungeon says, hell no, he wasn't here, right? But he can say, hell no, right? But if he was here and he said, yeah, we want to do a chef, I can hold him accountable. And that's where the most friction happens with clients is like having the time to get the right people in the room. Yes? When you were talking, the, the reason you wound up gyrating to that chef is yeah. you, took a constra- you took one of the constraints off, which was people having a resource, which is Sure, a budget, yeah. However, yep. um, just to make it more creative, okay. a meal prep place is really hiring a chef, except doing it with, uh, with a return because you're spreading it over a population. Yeah. So really, if you were taking the constraint off, you could wound up creating a product That's right. and, 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 and gyrating into a product that you could accomplish what people want, but at the same time do it where you can have them uh, try to disper- uh, uh, spread the, the, the cost across people, mm-hmm. which is how the, the meal prep companies started. That's right. And if you think about it, that's what they really are. Well, that's what it is. And also, he brings up a good point. <coughs> constraints should be, a, you should already know your requirements going into this, right? Like you know your restraints, you know your requirements, limitations, legal, whatever it is, right? You go into this knowing that kind of stuff, and that's the kind of stuff that when you you know you go into it and you're doing your research and your and your synthesis, you kind of remind the crew through like a creative brief or whatever it is, like that that is the case. So that's how you overcome that. Yes. So is the assumption oh, that a chef is a ready-made like object in our world? Like I, I love that. That is a risky assumption that we need to test in the field. Because well, that is what that's what comes with ideas. And that's what we go into prototype field testing and learning, building, and measure to validate. So that's where that comes in. There was another question. Um, yeah, what if you do the research and um, you get to the idea stage, you can't think of any idea to solve the, the problem. At that point, do you go back to research and change the question or Absolutely. I mean the challenge statement, I, I just put one today. But in the real life, you might want to have three or four challenge statements that you can bring into your just design it, just do it phases. Um, so this way, if one does fail, you've got something to fall back on. One last question. Uh, what happens if we learn that actually our assumptions were wrong uh, in our building MVP uh, kind of uh, phase? Because uh, what I see in the first part, okay, we did a synthesis, but we didn't actually uh, yeah. do any verification of our idea if it would work. Uh, kind of doing the prototype maybe costly. Well, that's so prototyping and design world is going to be without code. We're going to try to figure out. There's a big strategy here in prototyping. If you can figure out how to simulate or emulate a product without code, you're like a freaking genius in design. <laughs> but that's kind of what we try to do. We try to we try to not build anything, no technology in order to validate um, our product before we build it? That's a very good question. Last question. Real quick. Um, this uh, diagram and the last one, yep. um, is this something that you customized? Or if I wanted to learn more about yep. um, the process, do you have any books to recommend? Any, any? Sure. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Good question. So for me, um, IDOU is a really good resource. Um, Sprint by Jacob Knapp. Check that out. Um, Lean UX for startups, I forget the author's name. Eric Weiss. Yep, Eric Weiss. Um, there's a few resources, and if you Google Double Diamond Design Thinking, you'll get this. It's Creative Commons. I basically downloaded it and just edited it. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you.